Chapter 23, Growth and Development. We will start with the prenatal period. The prenatal period begins at conception and continues until birth. Fertilization to implantation requires the first 10 days of the prenatal period. The placenta is the part of the female body that provides an exchange of nutrients between the mother and the fetus. Here you can see a picture of the ovary which produces the ovum at ovulation. Fertilization normally occurs in the fallopian tubes where the cells start to divide. And then implantation occurs in the uterine walls. The prenatal period lasts for about 39 weeks. The embryonic phase extends from the third week after fertilization to the end of the eighth week of gestation. The fetal phase extends from the eighth week to the 39th week of gestation. All organ systems are formed and functioning by about month four of gestation. Stem cells are the unspecialized cells that reproduce from that original ovum to form the specific cells that develop into tissues and organs. The formation of new organs is known as organogenesis, and tissues is histogenesis. These are what give rise to the definite structures such as things like skin and muscles. This growth process includes cell differentiation, multiplication, growth, and rearrangement. From month four of gestation until delivery, most of the development of the baby is just a matter of growth and a little bit of maturing. Here you can see a table that lines up some of the growth to help you see what happens where. So you can tell most of the development occurs in the first trimester. The process of birth is called partuition. At the end of week 39, the uterus becomes irritable. This encourages the fetus to take a head down position and press against the cervix, and also triggers muscular contractions to begin and to initiate labor. The amniotic sac ruptures at this point, which is commonly referred to as water breaking. This also triggers the cervix to dilate and causes the fetus to move through the vagina to the exterior. And here you can see an illustration to show the stages that occur. Stage 1 is the period from the onset of uterine contractions until the dilation of the cervix is complete. This is more preparing for the delivery. Stage 2 is the delivery itself, the period from the time of maximum cervical dilation until the baby exits through the vagina. And then you have stage 3, which is where the body... Um, gets rid of the placenta, which was just the lining of the uterus to feed the fetus, as this is not necessary anymore. Sometimes clinicians call the recovery period after the delivery of the placenta the fourth stage of labor, but you don't need to worry about that. APGAR scores are used to assess the general condition of a newborn infant. I don't expect you guys to know the number stages here, just that they're used to assess the condition of the newborn. And then there's a cesarean section, commonly known as a C-section, and this is when the baby is surgically delivered instead of naturally through the vagina. This is normally occurs through an, through an incision in the abdominal and uterine wall and occurs either if there is an emergency in the pregnancy or, difficult, or difficulty with delivery itself. Multiple births are when there are two or more infants that occur during the same pregnancy. 
they can be divided into either identical siblings or fraternal siblings. Identical siblings result from the splitting of the tissue made from the same zygote, which makes them genetically identical. This means that they have to be the same gender and will have the same characteristics. Fraternal twins develop from different eggs that are fertilized separately, which means they can be two entirely different people. They simply share the same placenta. For implantation disorders, under the category of disorders of pregnancy, there is an ectopic pregnancy, which you should remember from our last chapter. This is when the implantation of the egg occurs someplace outside of the uterus. Most commonly, this occurs in the fl fl fallopian tubes shortly after fertilization. This is very dangerous, and if the baby is allowed to develop here, it will actually rupture the fallopian tubes, which will kill the developing fetus and greatly endanger the mom. This is why normally tubal pregnancies must be taken care of as soon as they are discovered. There's also placenta previa, which is when the growth of the placenta is at or near the cervical opening. This often results in separation of the placenta from the uterine wall and can be very dangerous for the mom. And then there is ab abrupto placenta, which is when there is the separation of the normal placenta um, from the uterine wall. Another serious disorder is preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is also known as toxemia of pregnancy. This is a syndrome of pregnancy that includes hypertension, proteinuria, which means protein in the urine, and edema, which may progress to eclampsia, which is a very severe toxemia that can actually result in death. Preeclampsia is normally something monitored very carefully for during labor and in the stages before. Fetal death. Fetal death can be either the spontaneous abortion, also known as a miscarriage, before the week um, 20. Stillbirth is after the week 20, and that's because week 20 defines um, viable life. So that's when a baby would be considered to survive. Birth defects are another problem that can occur. These can either be inherited, which means they're genetic, or they can be acquired at some point during the pregnancy. Acquired defects are often caused by tetragens, which are agents that disrupt the normal development of the fetus. For postpartum disorders, there's purpula fever, which is caused by a bacterial infection that can progress to septicemia and even death. And this occurs in moms after the delivery, so the postpartum phase. There's also lactation problems. Lactation would affect the infant nutrition and can be disrupted by problems with mom, such as anemia, malnutrition, or other issues, such as mastitis, which is either infection or inflammation of the breast tissue. The postnatal period begins after birth and lasts until death. The divisions of the postnatal period are isolated into time frames, which can sometimes be misleading because life is really a very continuous process and we are constantly growing and developing. Obvious changes in physical appearance to the body and in whole, the proportion occur between birth and maturity. So you can see outlined here in this chart, a lot of growth occurs in those early years where once we hit adulthood, growth slows significantly. So what are the divisions of this postnatal period? Infancy, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood, and then finally older adulthood. Infancy happens in the first four weeks. Um, or the first four weeks of infancy, my apologies, are called the neonatal period. 
So this is directly after birth. This is when many cardiovascular changes occur. If you remember from the cardiovascular section, there are a few very specific alterations in fetal circulation. And these have to change to the same circulatory system that we have throughout our lives in order to accommodate the fact that now baby is breathing and circulating on their own. This is because the fetus is totally dependent on the mom, where the newborn has to become suddenly self-sufficient, at least according to respiration and circulation standards. Respiratory changes at birth also include that deep and forceful first breath. This is why we look for babies to cry when they are first born. It means they have to take in a very deep and forceful first breath in order to make noise. So the, the developmental changes that occur between the neonatal period and 18 months, this is because infancy lasts the first 18 months of life, and the fact that the baby will double its weight by four months and triple it by a year. There will be an increase of 50% in length by the first year. This is when they start to develop their normal spinal curvature, which occurs by about 15 months. They're normally able to raise their head by about 3 months, crawl by 10, stand alone by 12 months, and normally they can run around 18 months. After this, they will hit childhood. Childhood extends from the end of infancy to puberty, which normally occurs between the ages of 13 and 15, though this does depend on the individual and the gender. Boys tend to hit puberty later than girls do. Overall, the rate of growth remains rapid, but does decelerate with age. The continuing development of motor and neuro motor, neurological, and coordination occurs during this period, as well as the loss of the deciduous or baby teeth and the eruption of permanent teeth. After childhood is adolescence. The average age of adolescence is normally 13 to 19 years. There is normally, normally a period of rapid growth resulting from sexual maturity, and that's related to the sex hormones that are now being secreted. This is also what triggers the appearance of the secondary sex characteristics. This is why growth spurts normally happen in adolescence, normally about between the ages of 10 and 12, as those sex hormones start to be released. And then finally, we will hit adulthood. This is when our growth plates, if you remember back to the skeletal system, fully close, and other structures, such as, such as the sinuses, acquire their adult placement. Adulthood is characterized by the maintenance of the existing body tissue though degeneration of this body tissue also begins during this phase in our life. Finally, we will hit older adulthood. In older adulthood is where the degenerative changes characterized or characteristic of older adults happen. So every organ of the body does undergo degenerative changes, and this is common just from normal wear and tear of life. So the effects of aging. So there will be effects on every system, but just so that you can point out a few of them, the skeletal system. So aging changes the texture, calcification, and shape of bones. Bone spurs, which cause arthritis, occur around the joints. And bones become more porous and are more easily fractured. And degenerative joint diseases such as osteoarthritis become more and more common. Skin. As we age, skin sags. This is become because it becomes thinner and drier and loses its elax elasticity as well as the fat and muscle layers located underneath. Pigmentation problems become more common in the older adult. And frequently there is thinning or loss of hair. For the urinary system, the nephron units located in the kidneys decrease by 50% between the ages of 30 and 75. This changes the blood flow or changes how blood filters through the kidneys. And blood flow to the kidneys changes the ability to form urine, which causes this to decrease as somebody ages. Also, bladder problems are common, such as the inability to void, 
um, or the inability to control voiding because of muscle, muscle wasting in the bladder wall. There are also changes in the respiratory system. This is because there's calcification of the collateral cartilage of the ribs, so that means that the flexible cartilage becomes more like bone and hard and rigid, which means that this limits the rib cage's ability to expand and change position. This causes a barrel chest appearance in older adults. There's also the wasting of respiratory muscles, which decreases respiratory efficiency. And the respiratory, respiratory membranes become thick, which challenges and slows the ability of oxygen to move from the alveoli to the blood to then oxygenate the rest of the body. For the cardiovascular system, there is the degeneration of heart and blood vessels, as vessel-related diseases are common among older adults and can have some serious effects. Fat deposits in blood vessels known as atherosclerosis, also often decrease the blood flow to organs like the heart and can cause a complete blockage of the coronary arteries, resulting in a heart attack. There's also the hardening of arteries, which is called arteriosclerosis, and could eventually result in the rupture of blood vessels. This is why we see a more common occurrence of stroke in older adults, as this happens to one of the vessels in the brain. Hypertension or high blood pressure is also common in older adults because of this arteriosclerosis. Our sense organs all slowly and gradually decline as we age. The lenses in our eyes become, hot, become harder and can no longer accommodate for near vision. This is what results in the farsightedness of many older adults. And there's a loss of transparency of the lens or cornea, which is called cataract. Glaucoma is the increase of pressure in the eyeball and is often the cause of blindness in older adults. The loss of hair cells in the inner ear produces an increased rate of deafness in older adults, or at least difficulty hearing. There is also a decreased transmission of sound waves, which is caused by the loss of elasticity of eardrum and the fixing of the little bones in the ear, sort of like arthritis in your ear, which limits how much they can vibrate and decreases your ability to hear. To some degree, hearing impairment is universally present for those reasons. And also, as we age, only about 40% of our taste buds will remain by the time we hit the age 75. Our reproductive system changes as well. For men, an erection becomes more difficult to achieve and maintain. For women, the lubrication during intercourse normally declines. Fertility... So women experience menopause, normally between the ages of 45 and 60, and this is when they can no longer produce eggs to become fertilized. Men, on the other hand, will remain fertile throughout the later adult years. Here you can see just a picture to illustrate some of the changes that occur with aging. And this brings us to the end of this lecture.